Um, <clears throat> so today we're going to be talking about uh, functions in Python and defining your own custom functions. So we've already seen a whole bunch of functions. So we've already seen, for example, print is a function. Um, and so basically we've already seen that the way that you actually use these is you type whatever the name of the function is, you put some parentheses, and then you pass it some arguments. So in the case of print, you print hello, for example. Then we go into here and we run it. We get hello printed. <clears throat> So uh, we've seen a whole bunch of them. We've also seen different ones where you have things like, for example, with shopping list, you can have shopping list is equal to an empty list. And then you have uh, shopping list dot append. Oh, whoops, append. And then you can give it like four and then print the shopping list. And then we get four inside of a list. <clears throat> so we've already seen that there's a couple different ways to do uh, functions. So we're not going to be covering this one. This is going to be covered in the uh, next module on classes. Um, but what we are going to be talking about is defining our own functions instead of just having the having to use the predefined ones like print, input, int, etc. Um, being able to define our own classes that'll be able to do whatever we need to. No, oh, excuse me. So um, there's a couple of reasons why doing this is important. Uh, one is reuse. There is a ton of value in having functions that are reusable. Um, being able to simplify things down and then be able to reuse something means that you can have more predictable results. Again, if you have to copy paste, you know, 20 lines of code every so often and then make some changes to it and whatever, if you make a mistake, then it can be, it can cause issues. Um, also just being able to reuse code means that you can spend a lot less time setting things up. Again, if you have some sort of uh, library that you can bring in and has a whole bunch of functions in it, um, then not having to write your own implementation of things is super nice as well. Uh, we'll cover that more in, uh, I think it's module six where we cover um, Python modules. And so that'll, this will be kind of important for that as well. Um, but just being able to reuse your functions saves you a ton of time and a lot of effort, um, which is good when you're writing programs because, believe me, you want to save as much time and effort as you possibly can. <laughs> um, <clears throat> the second thing is organization. Uh, so I've actually, I have an example in the docs here. I'll pull this out. Uh, whoops. Um, so in the doc here, you can say, you can see here with this where it says, uh, for example, like the, we know that this is the game loop for some, some game. We don't necessarily see the entire rest of the code, but we can see what's going on because the naming here makes it pretty obvious that we're saying, so we're doing player move, whatever that move entails, um, and then we're giving it player one, and then player two makes a move, and then we increase the number of turns. Uh, it looks like there's a loop that basically goes through 100 turns. <clears throat> and then if player one score is greater than player two score after that loop, then player two wins. So we don't actually even need to see the rest of the code to kind of understand what's going on here. So it's basically some sort of game that's uh, 100 turns, one player moves, the other player moves, there's some sort of score that's marked, and then um, player one's, so if player one score is greater than player two score, they win. If player one scores less than player two scores, then they win. So without even having to see the rest of the code, just in isolation, we can understand and contextualize what's happening here. Um, which is another great ad, uh, advantage of having functions, especially well-named ones. <clears throat> and the third is third reason is modules or APIs, um, and so that just basically, uh, like I said before, some, like sometimes your code won't always be directly used by people. Um, and so, for example, before we used the random module to generate a random number in the last um, last module. And so that's an example of an API where we're running functions that we don't necessarily need to know all the details. Like we don't need to know how randint is generating the random number. We just care about the fact that it is generating a random number. Um, yeah, so let's, uh, so let's get into defining some of our own. <clears throat> so the example that I've given in the docs is kind of boring. Uh, it's a function called sum, so we can just use the keyword def. And then from there, we can type whatever the function name is and then Inside here, we can put as many arguments as we want. So let's say, for example, number one and oops, uh, comma 
um, two, and then we'll just do print num1 plus num2. Okay, and so we have that in there now, and so we can say print sum of four and six, just for example. And so, let's go back here, and we'll go run that, and you see we get 10. Um, and so basically what's, it, it, it's not, this isn't a very exciting example, um, but you can see kind of the basic structure of how this works. So in this case, we're, we're taking, we're creating two variables, which num, num1 and num2 um, in this case. And we basically create those variables inside this function, and then those variables can be used inside the function to do something with. Uh, another aspect of creating functions is that we can actually return these values. So instead of before we were just printing them, we can actually take whatever the result of this is and just return it directly so that it can be printed here. Because you see here we had none, and that was because we weren't actually returning anything, and so Python by default just returns a none if you don't explicitly return anything inside your functions. So if we run this again, we just get 10, and that's because, um, well, I can show you actually with Python preview. Love this extension. Um, so I can show you exactly what happens. So there's a function being defined, and so that function's been defined here. And then inside here, it's gonna, cr it's gonna go in, it's gonna run it, so then it goes back and check what, checks what it needs to do inside sum, and so that sum call here, we have number one and number two, which are four and six respectively. <clears throat> and then it's just gonna go through and it's gonna return that value, which is 10. You can see here where it says return value 10. And then it's just gonna go to print sum and print it out. And you'll see here, um, because we didn't assign it any variable, um, this has actually disappeared now. So this, this, this call, once it's, once it's done, the num1 variable and num2 variable from sum no longer exist. And since it's been returned, the value no longer exists either. So if we wanted to store this, for example, um, and call it later, then we would need something like result is equal to sum for six. And instead we can print result here. And then if we go back to the Python preview, you'll see the result variable still exists, but none of the variables that were created during the running of that function exist. And so we can actually, what I can do here to prove that that's the case, we'll do result two and result three. And you can see with all of these things, because they're grayed out, none of these exist anymore. None of these variables exist. They were just created explicitly inside the function. Sorry, my printer's going off there. Um, they're just created explicitly inside the function and used just that one time. So like if, if we go down here, for example, and try and print uh, num1, for example, uh, I don't have to run it because we can just see num1 isn't defined because even though it's inside this function, it doesn't exist outside the function. So I can give a different value, for example, I can say num1 is equal to, I don't know, 15, something like that, right? And I can even put it before here, right? And you can see even when I'm going through with all of this different stuff, you can see num1 is 15, but the num1s inside here are all separate. So that's just one thing to keep in mind, is that the only variables it will pick up are variables that are explicitly passed, or variables that don't have another name. So for example, if I deleted this, and so there's no longer a num1, and got rid of num1, now Python will look outside of this function and try and find num1, which you'll find here. Um, and so this is called scoping. It's a little bit complicated and a little bit more than you need to necessarily know for this course. But if you are interested um, in Python 202, which uh, I'm currently working on, I go into a lot more detail of how Python deals with scopes and how this actually all works. Uh, but I'll also leave some references in the um, in the uh, module uh, page here. I'll leave some references at the very bottom of this page to uh, give you an idea of how this works in case you are interested. <clears throat> okay, so there's a couple things to keep in mind. So we, this was a really simple example, um, but let's say we wanted to do, let's get rid of Python preview for now. Um, let's say that we wanted to do something more complicated. Uh, let's say, for example, that we wanted to 
uh, validate an input is a certain int between a given range. Let's say def validate int, and let's say start, um, let's say uh, minimum, maximum. Okay, and then we just say uh, if, so we'll just say minimum, maximum, and then we'll just say value, and then we'll just say if value is less than minimum, return false. If value is greater than maximum, return false, else return true. And so what we're doing here is we're gonna, we have three different arguments here, right? So we have the minimum, the maximum, and the value. So let's say that we're taking something, an input at the command line. And let's say we have um, int input, enter a number between one and 10, right? And uh, let's just say that's user input. Then now what we can do is we can say um, valid input is equal to validate int. Validate int is between, I think I said 1, 10, and then the user input. Okay, and then if valid input print input is valid else print input is invalid. <clears throat> okay, so now that we have that, let's just take a look at this. So when we run this, and it says enter number between 1 and 10, so let's say we enter uh, 2. It says input is valid. I'm going to actually quickly just do this so that it's easier to see. Um, okay, so now we have a valid case, right? We entered in a 2 here. Uh, I know it's kind of hard to tell, but we did enter in a 2, and it said that the input is valid. Now let's say we entered in a 0. <clears throat> we get input is invalid. And so, uh, unfortunately, I don't think Python Preview lets me do... Yeah, user input isn't supported, so I can't actually show you the trace for this. But basically what's happening here is it's asking for a number, right? And so I've given it 0. And then once I've given it zero, that user input value gets passed along with the minimum, which is one, the maximum, which is 10, <clears throat> to user input. And then the user input is passed as the value. So at this point, when we go back up to validate int, what's happening is value is equal to whatever I entered. So in this case, it was zero. So value is equal to zero, minimum is equal to one, maximum is equal to 10. <clears throat> and then it just goes through, right? So it just checks value is less than minimum, which in this case is the case, and so it just returns false. And um, yeah, and then if I entered, for example, two, then it would say value less than minimum. That would not be the case, so it goes on, and then it says if value is greater than maximum, which is also another case, then it goes on and it returns true. Now this is all well and good, um, but let's say that you're trying to, let's, let's say you can't see this function, right? And you're trying to figure out how you want to do this, right? And so I type in validate int, for example, right? And I, uh, and I do this. <clears throat> and now I'm looking at it and I'm thinking, well, how the hell am I supposed to use this function? Like, I don't really know what I'm supposed to do with this function. I know there's a function. Quit the function here, right? And here it is. But what am I supposed to do? So this is where having a doc string is really important. And so what a doc string is, is it's a specific thing that you put in your functions that lets people know what you're supposed to do with it. So if I hover over the print function, for example, you see it says value, and then it's got some ellipses, and then sep, and file. You you guys probably don't know what the rest of these uh, arguments are, but that doesn't matter, because what we see is prints, uh, prints the values to a stream, or sys.out by default. Um, that probably actually also doesn't make a lot of sense to you, but uh, basically it tells people what your function does. And so if I go in here, what I can do is we have this function here. I can just add, oh, whoops. So I can just add three quotes here, right? 
and I can just say what the function does. Validates an int is within range um, of minimum and maximum. Okay. And then what I can say is, um, well, this is where it gets kind of weird. There's a whole bunch of different options that you can choose for how you want to organize your doc strings. Um, but one of the most common ones is what's called the NumPy doc strings, and that's what I'm going to use. <clears throat> and so the way that it works is you just give headings. So for example, parameters. And then you say what each of the arguments that are being passed in are. So you'd say minimum and int. And then you just say the minimum value. You'd want to make it a bit better than this when you're writing them yourself, but I'm just uh, just for the sake of making this a bit easier on myself, I'm just doing this kind of badly. Um, maximum value of the range. Right. And then after that we have value, which is an int, and it's value to validate is within range. And then the only other thing that's really important here is that we have returns. And in this case, we're going to return a bool. And that is um, true if value is in range, else false. Right, <clears throat> and so now when we when we go down and we go and look at this validate int, you can see here now we have okay, so we have minimum, maximum, value, and we see it validates an int is within the range of the minimum and maximum, and we have the minimum which we know is an int and it's the minimum value of the range, maximum is an int which is the maximum value of the range, and the value which is the value to validate within the range, uh, and we know that it returns a boolean which is true if it's in range, else it's false. <clears throat> so now we know how to use this, right? We see how many arguments there are, we know what we need to put in here, and we are good to go. So that's pretty, pretty. It's a pretty simplistic look at how variables work. Um, basically, the, the one thing that you need to keep in mind is that just because you say in your doc string, for example, that someone should put in an int, doesn't actually necessarily mean that they're going to put it in it. So if I go into here and I put like 4.2 and you know 6.5 and then the user input, then when I'm going through here, it's not going to fail, right? Like I can I can put in uh, I guess five would be the only integer that would work, um, and it will still give me input as valid, right? This doesn't actually force. It's not like other languages like Java and whatever where it actually forces it to be the certain type. This is just a recommendation. Um, so just keep that in mind when you're writing your code, because sometimes you'll have to do some checks to make sure that it's the right type for certain certain pieces of code. Um, and the next thing as well is uh, keyword arguments. And so keyword arguments are super helpful because what they allow you to do is they allow you to have default values. That's their, that's their biggest use case, not the only use case for them, but it is super helpful. So let's say, for example, instead we move this around, we say value, and then we say minimum and maximum. And let's say we want our minimum to default to zero if one isn't provided. And let's say we want our maximum to default to 10 if one isn't provided. And let's just move these around in order. Oops. And then let's just do this as well. At the end of this, we'll just say default. Two, zero. And default to 10. And so now, the cool thing about all of this is that we can actually choose, so if we hover over this now, we can see here, it just says minimum equal to zero, maximum equal to 10. If we decide not to enter anything in here, by default, because we've provided the user input, we can just go ahead and use it, right? And so it just works the exact same way. It just means that this value is by default that. And then if we want to change it, let's say we want to say the maximum is equal to 15. Change this to 15 as well. We can just do that. And then now we can have 11. 
and it works just the exact same way. And you'll notice that we can do things out of order. So now I can do maximum first and minimum first. It doesn't actually matter. Um, there we go. And so now I can have minimum and I can give it zero and the input's invalid. Um, it doesn't matter which order, key, these are called keyword arguments. These keyword arguments doesn't matter what order they're in, but arguments that don't have any defaults like this one here, it does matter which order you put them in. So just keep that in mind. These are called positional arguments and you can tell the difference because for one, keyword arguments have to come after all of your positional arguments. So the positional arguments here uh, have no defaults. And so um, they have to come beforehand and it does matter which order they're in. So if I had another variable here, uh, it does matter which order. I can't just do, for example, value is equal to user, right? It, it wouldn't, it, it would work. So um, there we go, we can get rid of that. Uh, there is one more thing that you can do um, that's kind of helpful sometimes. So if I'm just gonna go ahead and get rid of these keyword arguments here. Um, and we'll switch it back to user inputs. Uh, one and ten. Um, there is another thing that you can do that's kind of useful, which is you can do what's called type hinting, which again, this doesn't enforce anything, but if you want to make it more obvious what's happening, you can actually do colon and then you can specify what type the argument should be. So I can do this, I can do this, and I can do this. And you can also specify what the return type is going to be. So I can do this and type in oops, cool. And so now, when I'm looking at validate int, you can see, I can see in here what everything is supposed to be, and I can see what's gonna be returned even. So even if I didn't have this doc string, which is never a good idea, you should always have a doc string. Let's say for example, you forgot it. If you at least have this, when people are looking at it, they can at least see the types that they're supposed to put in and what they're supposed to receive back, which is super helpful. Um, again, this doesn't enforce the types. It just says this is what they should be. So just, just keep that in mind. Um, Okay, so uh, let's move on to uh, some of the exercises. So I would recommend going ahead and doing them yourself first, and then uh, after that coming back to this and you can watch me work through the solutions for the exercises and the challenges. Okay, so let's go ahead and quickly download the exercises. And we will quickly download the challenges as well. Oh, okay. All right, so let's take a look at what we're looking at here. Uh, start with the exercises. So um, add a doc string to the function below. This function takes a list and prints all the items in a list. Okay. Uh, bonus try using a type declaration for the arguments. This is literally just a matter of doing the right doc string. So let's just take this. So takes in a list and prints it. Okay. Um, what do we have here? So we have parameters and list to parsed, which is a list. Um, normally within lists, you can also put something in here like int or whatever, but it actually doesn't matter. So I'm just going to put star because it can be anything. Um, and then the list to print the items of boop and boop. And that's it because there's no return type because it just it, it just prints it. So there's nothing to worry about with that. So now if we hover over it, we'll see it takes in a list and prints it and it's a list of whatever and a list of items to print. There we go, cool. So that's the uh, that's the doc string um, with the uh, arguments. There's no return type. I mean, you could technically do this if you really wanted to, um, but it doesn't actually, because that's actually what happens, but you don't have to, it doesn't really matter. Uh, if nothing is there, then it's assumed that there's nothing being returned. Um, <coughs> Okay, so I'm gonna go ahead and delete this because it looks like we don't need it. I just want to double check and make sure we didn't need it for the next exercise, which we don't. So uh, implement 
uh, delete item function below, all the details should be there for you. Hint, you can use del of lists index to remove an item from the list. Okay, cool. So pass, oh yeah, this is one thing I didn't mention. So pass in Python basically is a way for you to write out all of your functions that you're gonna need to do without having to actually have them do anything. This just basically does nothing. Um, so what we can do is we just need to delete and then return to the list with the items removed. Okay, so we'll just make result equal to the list to parse, I'm sorry, del the list to parse at the item index. Index, and then we just need to return the result. And we can get rid of the pass and the comment, and that should work. Uh, it is del, right? And you can use del list index to, yeah, okay, cool. Um, uh, test should remove ham. Okay, so it should only print eggs and sausages. So let's just go ahead and I need to quickly jump into the downloads folder. And it's Python, Python 101 function exercises. Hi. Um, oh, you know what? Hold on. Um, I do know what's going on here. It's because we need results to be equal to the list first. And then we do results is equal. Right, we just delete. So we just do del result. Oh, oops, del result of item index. There we go. There we go. Eggs and sausages. So yeah, so that worked out perfectly. Um, the one thing I am curious to see. Is yeah no okay that should be fine um, sorry yeah no that'll be fine um, and so then with that we can have we can now move on to the challenges and so the first challenge is create a function called validate input takes in a string returns true if the following conditions are met and false if they aren't this is pretty much the same as one of the ones that we had before so let's see what do we need. So there's three different things. Okay, so we gotta we gotta do the dog string as well, and um, the logic. So let's just start with the logic first, uh, and then I'll do the dog string after. Um, so create a function, takes a string. Ah, okay. So if um, if user input dot is lower. Return true. If user input dot end oops dot ends with eat eat sorry uh, if not sorry user input dot ends with eat uh, return true. We do this with the challenges. Let's take a look. Functions, challenges. Oh, there we go. Um, let's take a look. So we've got true, 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 true. Oh, user input one should be false. Yeah, okay. 
So why aren't the rest of them true? Um, dot ends with the eat. Okay, true if the following conditions are met, and false if they aren't. Hold on. Oh, I see. I've done this the opposite of what we need. So false. So true if the following conditions and false if they aren't. Oh, I see. So if not user input dot is lower. Okay, so this is this is why. So if any of these are the case, then these should all be false. Otherwise, it's true. Sorry, that question is worded weirdly. I need to go back and fix that. Uh, oh, not everything should be false, though. The first one should be true. Um, <laughs> let's just do this. Let's do some debugging. So print is lower. Print eat. Print, oops. print Q, uh, Q. And so we're just gonna put these in here and just see which, uh, what, oh, whoops. There we go. Let's see which one's true. So the first, excuse me? The first one does not end with eat. Hmm. Oh, yes, that is why. Sorry, these are all logical errors. Um, Q. Excuse me. Let's, uh, okay, let's, let's just do this one at a time. So let's just comment this out really quickly. Double check on something. False, 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 true. Now that doesn't make any sense. So this first one should be valid, but it isn't. So let's go through them one at a time and see why the first one, okay. Let's see why the first one's true. If not Q and user input. Okay, let's do this the long way around then, because I don't know why this is being weird. So let's do this. So for, let's use a loop. For letter in user input, if letter equals Q, return false. Else continue. Okay. All right, that worked now. I, I, okay, I don't know why that didn't work before, but let's take a look. Uh, oh, whoops. Um, let's get rid of these just so it's easier to read. Okay, true, and then the rest are all false. Okay, cool. Yeah, I don't know why. <laughs> that was weird. Um, all right, and so this is where things are super useful to start. Um, so let's do elif. Okay. Uh, this is where a comment becomes useful. We'll check if q is present. This one, we probably don't need to comment. It's pretty obvious, and this one's also pretty obvious. Um, if no, can conditions above are met, input is valid. 
Okay, so let's write our docs right now. So validate input does not fail validation criteria. And then we'll just put these in there directly. And then we'll just say parameter, oops, parameters user input. And since we did this type hint here, we actually don't need to specify that it's a string. We can if we want, it's just the NumPy doc string styles don't require us to. Um, so I'm not going to. Uh, the input to be validated and returns a bool uh, true if input is valid else false. Perfect, so now when we hover over this, it tells us validates input uh, does not fail a certain criteria. Uh, it actually might be worth it to just use an extra things there so that it shows up like a list. The input is all lowercase. It doesn't end with a yeet, and there are no cues in the input. Um, yeah, so there we go. So there's there's the code for this. Um, that took a lot longer than I thought it was going to. <laughs> uh, okay. Create two functions with doc strings. Uh, add to dictionary that takes a dictionary key and a value as an argument and returns a dictionary with a key and value added. Um, and to print dictionary, a function that takes a dictionary as an argument and prints it, its keys and values. Uh, if you loop over a dictionary with a for loop, each iteration is a key, and keys are how you access values in a dictionary. Okay, cool. So the first one, we should be able to just... So we take in the dictionary, and we take in the key, and we take in the value, and then we give it back the dictionary. Okay, cool. So. Um, this is actually really easy. We just literally have to do dictionary of key is equal to value. That is actually really easy. Okay, so let's just do that. And user is equal to add to dictionary user. Why is it not? Oh, I see. It's because it, the print isn't. Yeah, sorry. So let's just print user really quickly, just so we can see. Um, and so we get name, age, and country, which is what we're trying to add. So the add to dictionary function is working correctly. Okay. Now print dictionary. Um, what did it have to do? Function that takes dictionary as an argument and prints its keys and values. Okay, cool. So let's just do this. So for key in dictionary print key returns value, and then we just do. Dictionary of key. Okay, and so that should work. So name returns value Kieran Wood, age returns value 21, and country returns value Canada. So yeah, that works out perfectly. Basically, for this, for each iteration that it's going through in the dictionary that's being passed in, it will get the key, and then with that key, we can use it to print key returns value, and then just whatever the value is for that key in the dictionary. Cool. Uh, and then we can just do the doc strings for both of these. Uh, uh, takes dictionary and prints key value pairs. Um, parameters. Dictionary, the dictionary to print the key value pairs. 
of. And for this one, we have takes in a dictionary key and value and adds the key value pair to the dictionary. And parameters. the dictionary with the key value pair added. I know I'm working a little bit backwards here. Uh, that's sometimes what I like to do. Um, but the dictionary, the dictionary key value pair two. Uh, key. Dictionary and value the value for the key in the dictionary. So this may seem a little bit like annoying at first. So having a doc string for every single one of your functions, you're probably looking at it and you're going, Jesus, this is so annoying. Why the hell am I even bothering to do this? Believe me, when you get down the road and four months back, you come down and you come down back to your code and you see print dictionary and add to dictionary, you may think now that it's obvious and that anybody in the world will be able to understand it. Believe me, I've come back to my code after a year or two and I have absolutely no idea what the hell is happening with the code and I can guarantee you neither will you. So make sure to just add at least something, at least specify what's happening or like what what the what it's supposed to do and then if you don't want to do the rest of the stuff where you have parameters and whatever at least do the type hinting if you don't want to specify this parameter stuff like at least have this like it's not great but at least it's somewhat useful like even even just having this here where you have it and it tells you what you need to do and then you can get and then you get back addict at least with this people can somewhat understand what's happening whereas with nothing believe me even the most obvious things like when you're looking at it and it's like 2 a.m and you're coming back to look at your code to try and fix something um or even worse you have somebody who's paying you to do something and you're coming back to look at it at like one o'clock in the afternoon but there's a bunch of pressure because it's like it's making it so that they have to you know stop their work that they're currently doing to try and get this fixed um believe me even the most obvious functions can seem pretty complicated so um just make sure that you have all of your stuff down uh, and with at least some sort of a doc string so that when you come back to it you don't hate yourself because <laughs> uh, believe me it happens um, okay, so thanks for watching this module. Uh, so if you have, if you want to see the solutions that I had originally, these solutions can be found here. You can just click solutions, uh, and if you want, you can also download the solution just using the same button that you use to download the challenges and the exercises. Uh, and next time, we're going to be taking a look at classes, which should be a whole bunch of fun. See you there.